Good evening to all those watching via YouTube and to those in Zoom. Welcome to the third event in our continuing series, Resilience in Times of Crisis. My name is Rabbi Max Feldhake, and I am the project leader for the Jewish Future Forum. In our last event with Professor Dr. Hazia Diner, we learned about the various strategies applied and adapted by the American Jewish community to deal with the aftermath of the Shoah. This gave us a key insight into the various and at times contradictory types of resilience which emerged in the American Jewish community after the war. After the war. We learned that there is no one model, but a vast number of them, all equally authentic. Once again, the world waits with bated breath as we see the Delta variant spreading across the world. In Germany, the vaccination campaign has made major gains. Will all this be enough to avert another wave in the crisis? And what about all that which has already been lost in the course of the last year? We look around and we see a world in crisis on many fronts. The climate crisis is getting worse and leaves a path of destruction in its wake. Conflicts around the world are still raging. How will we be able to put this world back together again? Is there anything that we can do? Today, we jump from New York back to Europe France, but by way of Greece. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Rabbi Delphine Orveilleux, with whom we will look at the topic of resilience and her presentation on the Jewish art of reparation. Rabbi Orveilleux uh, describes her talk with the following remarks. The temple is destroyed. The wedding glass is shattered. What if all these rites helped us to think about reparation? A study on the meaning of the broken in the tradition. Certainly an argument can be made that our world is broken, politically, socially, economically. The Jewish tradition steeped in brokenness and loss, but also resilience in overcoming this is a great repository of how to mend a broken world. Daphine was born in France. She left to study medicine at the Hadassah Center at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem before returning to France to study journalism. After studying at the CELSA, she joined the editorial staff of France too, serving notably in the Middle East office in Jerusalem. She then studied in New York at the Rabbinical Seminary of the Hebrew Union College, go HUC. Following her ordination at HUC in 2008, she became one of the rabbis of the Mouvement Juif Libéral de France in Paris. In 2009, she took the helm of the Tenua Review, where she became editor in chief, and then in 2012, managing editor. Since 2017, she has also been leading the Tenua workshops, study and dialogue sessions that regularly bring together some 300 people every month in Paris. In 2020, during the COVID-19 lockdown period, the online version of these workshops united tens of thousands of people every week. She's one of the founding members of Kerem, the Council of French-Speaking Liberal Rabbis. Delphine is married and the mother of three children who are enjoying a lovely, lovely time in Greece. And it is my great, great, great pleasure to give you the floor, and we are all very, very excited to be with you this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, this invitation. As you said, I'm currently in Greece spending vacations with my family, but I'm happy to spend this evening uh, with you, um, with the students, people joining us, uh, rabbinic and cantorial students uh, joining us. Um, I hope I'll be able to meet you all soon, maybe in Berlin, maybe hopefully uh, physically and not simply over Zoom. I'm currently in Greece and more specifically, I'm... Um, I'm talking to you from uh, somewhere near Thessaloniki, a city you probably know because it has a very important Jewish history. Uh, Thessaloniki is known, um, for example, uh, for the story of Shabtai Tzvi. You know, Shabtai Tzvi used to preach from this place, from somewhere near here in the 17th century. Shabtai Tzvi is a famous story of what we often call a false Messiah, a false messianic history, maybe the most famous one in our uh, tradition. But to understand the story of Shabtai Tzvi, you need to understand in which time he was preaching and to understand that it was a very specific time of uh, crisis time, a time of post-pogrom era, the Chalmikis uh, Cossacks uh, 
pogrom were just behind us. They were still in the air, the trauma of the expulsion from Spain. And at the time, uh, many eschatological narratives and millenarist uh, discourse developed in the area. And uh, this is a very classical phenomenon. The world is suddenly in crisis and it finds a specific theological translation, um, a kind of in the context of crisis, a kind of desperate hope for reparation uh, and eschatology, a temptation um, for a kind of end of history discourse. People look for a complete reparation or a complete solution that they believe could be near. And suddenly they hope for a savior, a messiah that could come and heal them and repair the world around them. And it's an interesting story to remind um, to remind us because we do experience today, obviously, as you just said, a time of crisis that many of us do experience as a moment of a liminal zone, liminal moment, liminal space in between time. So before I dive into this notion of crisis, and resilience and reparation in the Jewish world, in the Jewish language through Hebrew etymology, for example, I would like to remind you of a very famous quote you probably heard so many times this uh, year. It's a quote from Antonio Gramsci that so many people quote in the past year that I'm pretty sure you know it. Gramsci once said um, the following, he said, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born, and now is the time of monsters. So Gramsci defines that in this liminal zone between a world that is about to die and a world that is not yet born or not yet defined, it's a monstrous time. How should we understand this idea of monsters appearing or monstrous time? To understand it, you need to maybe look for the Latin root, the etymology, Latin etymology of monster. Monster comes from the root uh, monstrum, which means in Latin, a warning or something that used to be hidden, but is suddenly perceivable. Something couldn't be seen, but is suddenly montrable, monstrable. It can be shown. It gave in English or in French the word to demonstrate. You hear it's the same root, monster and demonstrate, a demonstration. Something was not seen and something is suddenly heard or unveiled or perceived. And this is the monstrous time Gramsci talks about. And you can perceive this in today's world in today's discourse in this liminal zone we are going through today in the midst of this sanitary crisis undoubtedly you hear it in a very particular manner i'm sure you've been aware of that i personally um, around me i kept hearing those kind of liminal discourse and paradoxical discourse around me i very i hear very often people would talk to me about the new world they hope to build. You know, very often people tell you uh, uh, the minute the crisis is over, the minute the confinement is over, nothing will be the same in my life. I will change everything. Everything will be new and different. But in the same sentence, almost, the same people tell you the minute the crisis is over, the minute the confinement is over, I will go back to the same coffee shop. I will sit at the same table. I will ask from the same waiter uh, that used to be mine before the crisis to bring me the same uh, double espresso. Uh, you see what I mean? There is this paradoxical language that we keep hearing around us that is both a discourse of change radical change that people expect. And at the same time, a very strong level of nostalgia, hope to go back to what was. People want to change everything that was, and at the same time, they expect to bring back the world uh, as it was. So now what I propose you, what I would like to do with you now is to dive into the etymology of crisis in Hebrew. In Hebrew, a crisis, in modern Hebrew, a crisis is called mashber, uh, a word you might know from modern Hebrew, but maybe you don't know that this word mashber comes from the Bible. In the Bible, in the biblical narrative, the word appears, but means something else. It doesn't mean crisis, but it means literally a birthing stool, uh, a mashber, 
is the place where women give birth. So if you ever stepped into such a room when people, where people, where women give birth to children, you know that it's a place of the, a weird mixture of emotion. It's a place of anxiety and hope. It's a place of fear, but at the same time of expectation and anxiety and hope and fear and expectation all ends in a very particular manner, this place. Um, and a crisis is a place of um, openness, um, of porosity, because in this place, there is a possibility of renewal, but at the same time, a possibility of death. And this place of porosity is generally perceived by many of us, if not by all of us, as a place, place of threat and fear of contamination. When everything opens, uh, there's a feeling of like liminal zone is, um, is a place of possible contamination, of passage between worlds. And obviously in a time of sanitary crisis, in a time of pandemia, we understand that there is a quintessential fear of contamination around us. People are even more than ever afraid of opening their doors, their walls, their frontier, their frontiers. And this idea of, um, uh, of birthing place, birthing stool is even more threatening and critical. So how do Jewish Theological tools can help us in this time of mashbel, in this time of crisis. I believe that um, Jewish crisis management is a very specific one, a very particular one. And in many ways, its recipes are almost opposite lessons from what other religions can bring. Let me give you an example. I think that many religious traditions center around ideas, especially in time of crisis, around ideas of togetherness, of oneness, union with the divine, union with each other, abolition of frontiers, abolition of differences. This idea is particularly strong in Far Eastern theology, in Buddhism, it's strong in Christianity too, and particularly I would say in Catholicism, you know, the etymology of the word Catholics come from the word Catholicos, which means universal, the idea of generating oneness, embracing all in one. Whereas Judaism is mainly built on the absolute reversal of opposite idea. There is in Judaism and in Jewish thought, a centrality uh, of this notion of afdala, of separation. Afdala being the major or the main agent of creation in our world. You know, you find it obviously in Genesis in the first chapters of the Bible, the world is created by Avdala. It's created by separation, separation between times and between spaces, between days, between the sea and the sky and between different species, etc., etc. And again, this rhetorics and this notion of separation, Avdala, is uh, at stake in many, many other moments um, of the narrative and of the books and stories and rights. I could give you so many examples of that. Uh, let's take a first one, this idea of alliance in the Bible, alliance Brit before, between God and uh, his creators, or the Brit between God and its people, Jewish people. Uh, you know, this notion of Brit in Hebrew is interesting because um, in English or in French, you say, to, you say that you seal uh, an alliance you unify an alliance, you seal an alliance. Whereas in Hebrew, you say exactly the, oppos the opposite. You say uh, that you have to lichot brit, which means in Hebrew, the word that we use, lichot, means to cut an alliance, to split an alliance. And this is what the narratives keeps repeating about different alliances in the book. For example, you probably remember Abraham uh, is first making an alliance with God through Brit Ben Abitarim, the idea of cutting animals into pieces in the same way that another sign of alliance is the Brit Mila, 
the circumcision, the idea of cutting something in the body, uh, in the same way that you probably remember another sign of alliance uh, in the story of Noah is the rainbow, and the rainbow being a diffraction, a breaking of the light. So as you see, the examples are many in the Bible, to prove you that um, in the biblical text, God is encountered not through the one, but through the many. Not through the one, oneness, but through the two, the three, and the more. The idea of splitting, separating, breaking as a condition of encounter with the other, the other person, or the other with a big O, with the divine. This idea of brokenness and diffraction is super central, is a very, very central scheme of Jewish narrative and Jewish uh, practice. And again, I could give you hundreds of uh, examples. Think about uh, Adam and Eve expelled from the Garden of Eden where, with the impossibility to go back, meaning the impossibility to be again one with the place of the origin. But we could also think about Abraham. Abraham has to live his um, native land, has to live Ur in Chaldea. He cannot be one anymore with the place of his birth. Think about uh, the Exodus, another good example of that. The sea splits before the Hebrew slaves uh, becoming free men and women. Uh, but the way it's described, the opening of the sea is described in Hebrew as kriyat yamsuf, which literally means that the sea is torn apart, torn into many, many different broken pieces. Think about Moses uh, getting down from Mount Sinai. What happened to the tablets? Immediately Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and he breaks the tablets and the pieces, the broken pieces of those tablets, according to the Midrash, will be carried constantly by the Hebrews when they cross the desert. We could speak, obviously, about the temple, uh, the destruction of the temple. The temple is broken, destroyed, not just once, but twice. And this brokenness, this destruction, is at the core of the development of rabbinic Judaism, undoubtedly. And we could quote many, many other moments, uh, rituals of Jewish life. I quoted before the Brit Mila, obviously, a baby enters the alliance through a cut. Uh, but you could think about funerals, also Jewish funerals. Uh, at the cemetery, once we bury someone, there is this gesture of the kriya, you know, kriya is the tearing uh, of the clothes uh, of the mourners to symbolize and to represent the tradition of memory that is the acknowledgement of the the tearing, the, the brokenness of um, existence and the frontiers and the limits. Uh, we could also think about different Jewish holidays. I always think about the Seder. You know, the Seder in Passover starts with a specific gesture. Um, the leader in the family or the leader at the Seder is doing what we call the yachat, you know, the breaking of the matzah. It's a very symbolic moment that uh, starts the Agadah, the, we, we can only tell our story of liberation if we start not from oneness, but from brokenness, not from the one, but from at least two or three pieces that have to be seen. And obviously, the most symbolic broken moment of Jewish life is the breaking of the glass at a wedding, you know, when a couple gets united when they're about to make one in a way. So we have to perceive and to hear the sound of division, the sound of brokenness, not just something broken, but a glass that is broken, that by definition will be impossible to repair. The glass can never be repaired. So it's almost you know, telling you visually and through hearing, there is a complete acknowledgement that the goal of what you build is not a complete reparation, but actually a certain ability that humanity has and that specifically couples do have to live with what is broken. And I think this is a major, major teaching of Judaism, this idea that the world 
is in a state of brokenness. The world around us is broken and an acknowledgement that it cannot be repaired. And actually the wisdom of humanity, of the Jewish people, but more, lar more largely the wisdom of humanity is supposed to be its ability to learn to live with scattered pieces. And this is, I believe, um, the particular recipe of Jewish resilience, an ability or an invitation to live with broken pieces. So I know that some of you probably think about tikkun olam at this moment, this very central notion of tikkun olam that we hear so often, especially in recent years, so many people talk about this tikkun olam, this ancient Kabbalistic concept um, that is so often used in uh, contemporary uh, uh, Jewish thought as an idea of uh, this injunction and commandment to repair the world. And I think, I believe there is a certain misunderstanding uh, about what tikkun olam truly means, or at least etymologically or literally uh, means. Um, I think, as I just said, that Judaism is really aware in many ways in its narratives and through its rights, that wholeness um, is unreachable. Um, if, if I may say differently, shalom is impossible. You know, shalom is a word that is often translated by peace, but actually shalom means, means something in with integrity, something complete. And Judaism in many ways suggests that shalom is uh, for now impossible. You know, we keep singing this famous song in synagogue that you probably know so many tunes to sing it. Ose uh, shalom bimomav, uyase shalom aleinu v'alkol Israel. If you listen carefully to these words, it said the one who makes shalom bimomav um, in the um, celestial, I mean, from above, up there, the one who makes shalom up there, he will make shalom among us here. But he will make is a future form. You know, shalom is present in the upper realm, but it's absent in the world we live in. It will be, but it is not right now. And we have to leave this world with a lack of Shalom. So to go back to this notion of tikkun olam, I think we need to go back specifically to the etymology, as I say, of those words. The word tikkun from, comes from the verb letaken, which doesn't mean originally to repair. Letaken has actually something to do with the action of intertwining or weaving pieces with one another. And even more literally, Letaken has something to do with building a braid to braid, uh, for example, you know, when a, a kala, when a bride is uh, prepared for the chupa, uh, the people who prepare her, who are making her beautiful, are supposed to do takana se'ar, which means in Hebrew something like braiding her hair. So tikkun is a way to organize together what is naturally split apart. And olam, which is translated often as the world, literally means in Hebrew, the void, the ne'elam. You know, olam in Hebrew means something void or even an absence. So if I had to translate tikkun olam more literally than repairing the world, I would say that tikkun olam literally means a weaving of the void, a way to organize, a way to braid the absence, to give form to the missing, to the broken, to the incomplete. So I, I guess that now you realize what I'm trying to, to say, the Jewish art of repairing is actually, I think, an art of dealing with what is not anymore. It's a kind of resilience recipe that doesn't teach you to repair something so that it will be complete, but tries to teach you and to, to learn to live with the broken pieces of the world, the broken pieces of your existence and your life.
Actually, all this has to do, and I would like to open a parenthesis, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more in a few minutes in our conversation. I think all this has to do in a very um, direct way with the question of anti-Semitism and the anti-Semitic narrative. As you know, Jews, a long history, have always been accused of um, breaking the world, of in a way creating breaches, breaches in bodies, breaches in identities, in nations, in frontiers. As you probably remember in the medieval era, Jews were always accused of polluting, poisoning wells or bringing disease or uh, you know, polluting minds or ideas, always associated with this notion of porosity and contamination. Um, it's uh, it has been true all along history. You probably remember also uh, a few years ago in, when uh, in Pittsburgh uh, there was this terror attack in Pittsburgh against the synagogue in in 2018. The, the killer um, wrote about his intentions and and he accused the Jews of making the American frontiers too porous. You might remember this argument. Um, so what is interesting is that when a society or a group or a family or a people starts dreaming about complete identity, um, closed frontiers, fear of change and contamination, you can be pretty sure that Jews will be soon perceived as the main uh, and the most threatening, porous and contaminating agents. From the anti-Semitic point of view, the Jews are the name of what prevents them from being completely themselves. Uh, in past days in France, I don't know if you followed that in the news, there were many anti-vaccination demonstrations and people were struck to see that in those demonstrations, here and there started to pop up, um, pop out uh, anti-Semitic rhetorics, anti-Semitic uh, discourse. And I think it's actually not surprising. There's a fear always of the liminal zone of blurred frontier, the idea that Jews are agents that try to contaminate you or penetrate your body and 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 mind. So I, I will maybe start a conclusion now so that we can engage in a in a in a conversation. As I said, I think the Jewish art of repairing is an acknowledgement that the world cannot be uh, fully repaired, but we have an ability to learn to live with uh, with brokenness. And actually times of crisis can be perfect moments to learn how to do it, um, when there are fantasies around us of completedness and absolute and complete reparations, we are, um, in, we are threatened precisely by moments of false messiah, the way Thessaloniki experienced a few centuries ago. Uh, the eschatological moment is always awakened by crisis when people are fantasies of integrity and uh, completedness. And maybe I will end this first part of the conversation with uh, uh, simply um, an allegory or a, a, a timely metaphor. We are entering now the month of Elul. And you know, the month of Elul is known as the month when we start to blow the shofar, supposed to start blowing the shofar uh, every day. And I think the shofar um, par excellence, like precisely the sound of the shofar, is an auditive reminder of the power of brokenness. You know, when you listen to the sounds of shofar, you go through tekia, and then shevarim, and then teruah, and you probably know these sounds, like tekia sounds like and then shevarim is like the sound is broken, and then we reach teruah, like the absolute brokenness we have to experience, we have to be able to go through this absolute scattered sound and broken sound, because this is the condition for a change. This is the condition to renew yourself. It depends on your ability to hear the broken and to see the broken world outside of yourself, inside of yourself. And then you can start believing it will lead you to Rosh Hashanah, to a true renewal to a true beginning, Rosh Hashanah, 
of the year, but you know, Shana is written in Hebrew like Shone, like difference. So if you go through this ability to envision and to listen to brokenness and to live with brokenness, then you can hope that you'll have the ability to be shone, to be different, and maybe, maybe to make the world a place a little bit less monstrous. Thank you all for being with me. Maybe now we can start a conversation with Joe and with all of you. Um, thank you so much, Delphine. I'd love to start my video myself, but as I was uh, turned off, I can't start it again. Um, there you go. There you are. Um, Delphine, thank you so much uh, for your talk. It was um, a lot, I must say, uh, was expected. So I was expecting um, a, very, uh, a very exciting uh, talk and a lot of great new ideas. What I wasn't expecting was the best imitation of a shofar that I've heard so far. Um, <laughs> and we'll be passing on the recording as a ringtone for cell phones in the future. Um, but, um, Delphine, let's uh, jump in right at that point, because I think a lot of, um, a lot of the people who are watching us now and a lot of the, the students it, uh, themselves um, will be at the same time surprised and also sort of like a little questioning of um, a talk about resilience basically ending in a vision of having to, of learning to deal with brokenness, right? It seems completely uh, con um, contraintuitive somehow, you know, you say, well, um, how do we form a, uh, how do we get a certain form of, uh, of strength, especially within the Jewish community, you um, then refer to the community as the basis of strength um, and the community that should be as uh, unified as possible, especially towards, um, uh, towards non-Jewish societies um, and so on and so forth. But um, and maybe you could get into uh, into sort of a more practical level what that actually means, right? So um, if we talk about living with um, with brokenness and living with division and so on, I would actually go so far as to say, well, that's the state we're in right now, right? So this is a state of brokenness um, on so many levels, right? If we think about different identity politics and so on, um, and uh, their consequences in our um, in our respective societies. Um, in Germany, there's this, um, uh, there's this magic formula um, called Gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt, which people like to quote saying the unity of society. Um, but if we look around us everywhere, there is no such thing. And maybe we should also just stop talking about this um, as a sort of a panacea for all of our, of all of our, um, uh, of, of the many um, difficulties we have to face. But um, exactly, Delphine, what does this exactly mean coming to terms with, um, with this reality? Mm -hmm. I absolutely understand where you're coming from. We're saying, you know, and after the pandemic, right, this after the pandemic, one gets tired of hearing these words after the pandemic, as one does the words, I'd love to be there with you in person, but now we're only over Zoom, right? These are sort of worst standardized functions in this time. But um, uh, after the pandemic also seems like a, like a time that will not actually come. Right, so like a time, um, or will come, but but maybe not uh, as soon as we as we would like. And also, what we've seen is that during the pandemic, the forces of division and the forces, the destructive forces, of um, uh, breaking uh, unity within uh, communities, for example, have actually grown in strength. Right, so we are now in a more broken state than we were before. Um, and how to um, and basically, I'll just put it a little polemically and say, is it what you're saying is, well, okay, and now deal with it? <laughs> no, I, I think what, what you're saying is interesting is that we live in a time of division, but at the same time, we live in a time where many people are obsessed with unity. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I think the social media is a good representation of that. I mean, we know that there are many, many polemics on the social media, but people tend to get rid more and more today of controversy, of true controversy, of what probably 
Judaism um, is very, you know, Judaism is very attached to this idea of machloket, the idea that mm -hmm. you should, which, uh, you know, you, you should cherish controversy for the sake of heaven. You know, you you, you have to disagree and to enter in, you know, discussion and polemics. But uh, what happens today in the social media is exactly the opposite of that. I mean, we're all aware of this phenomenon that people disagree but they are interested in sharing space and discussion only with people who share exactly the same opinion. People who read the same book, speak the same language, have the same community, vote for the same person. And actually, we kind of lost this ability to be in true machloket, in true, contro mm. true controversy. And I think it's something that maybe... Judaism can teach today in a very, or can renew this sacrality of machloket, of controversy that we kind of lost, I feel, in this, um, in this era and even more in this time of the, of the pandemia, of sanitary uh, uh, crisis. There is, we know in recent years, we all experienced this. There is um, an obsession uh, around identity coming from all parts of society. Uh, people want to um, claim they have a recipe of how they can be completely and authentically themselves. We hear it coming from the extreme right. We hear it coming very often from the extreme left today. Um, rhetorics of authenticity that um, deny the possibility of discussion with the other. And I do believe that um, Judaism has very specific teaching about that, about, you know, we, we repeat every day uh, the Shema a few times every day, the core prayer of our tradition claims this word that Hashem Echad, that God is one. And when we claim that God is one, we imply that we are not, that the mm -hmm. divine is about being one and humanity is not one. Humanity is plural in its languages. That's the teaching of the Tower of Babel but it's plural also in its interpretation that this very core notion of shivim panim la Torah, 70 ways of interpreting the Torah. And that's the core of the sacred exercise of machloket. And in a time of crisis, this is very, very difficult to, to develop because this is the paradox you pointed. People totally disagree, but are not interested in meeting the others truly. They are more interested in sharing space with their own community of beliefs and erasing or canceling, as we would say today, another opinion. And I think this is what we should really um, strive to, to be able to do. I mean, more than ever in a time of, of crisis, we need to develop, uh, you know, a virality, if I can use this word, a virality of uh, thought encounters, you know, of influences other each other. Right. But Dethi, how would you um, say that we could deal with common goals, for example, right? So if we're not, um, is there a, a way of saying this plurality within our societies, for example, um, is evident, right? It can't be argued with. People can say they agree with the concept that plurality is a good thing or a bad thing, but our societies are um, inherently pluralistic and have become more so uh, within the um, uh, late 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, and this plurality seems to, um, or pluralism seems to um, be in agreement with your, um, with the with the brokenness, but in a positive way, right? So saying we can also make uh, brokenness productive, but maybe also for common goals, right? So we don't always, we don't have to be the same, but we can still rally around common goals. And if we think about, um, I was, it was very interesting you speaking about um, birth and death. Um, and uh, when we're speaking about the climate crisis now, there is sort of a common goal for humanity, which is, um, which has basically come to survival, right? Um, how would you um, see a way of um, making this plurality, this brokenness productive in a way that actually can, um, uh, that all can benefit from? So not taking unity as something just 
very negative, but maybe also as something, you know, not as a homogenous uh, fantasy or a fancy of homogeny, but mm. um, as a goal that we can uh, achieve together through certain things like uh, the small things like the survival of, uh, of the human race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, small thing. Yeah, um, exactly. well, I, I guess what we have to to to, to share it's the basis of what we we must share because this is our only strength is actually the, a, a shared narrative. You know, sharing narratives and sharing stories, even if we don't interpret the stories in the same way, um, we cannot build Brit alliance if we don't share narratives. You know, when you were talking, I was thinking about uh, Yuval Noah Harari's book, like this absolute bestseller, uh, Sapiens, that's mm. millions of people read in, in, in the world. Um, there is a, a famous passage in Sapiens that uh, Harari wonders uh, what is specifically human. You know, um, a long history, philosophers have asked this question, what is... Uh, what we call in French le propre de l'homme, you know, what is specific to humanity. For a long time, we thought that language would, was what defined humanity. And we know today that uh, animals have an ability to, you know, to, to verbalize in a way. They have their own language. We thought that maybe funeral rituals were specifics to humanity, but we know today that some animals like uh, Elephants have their own cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera. So people try to define what, what, makes, what is specific to human. They thought it was sense of humor, for example, or the ability to laugh. And we know today it's not true that some uh, monkeys have an ability to make jokes to one another. But what Yuval Harari suggests is that our ability to tell stories and even fictions is what brings humanity together you know he gives a very funny example he said he says you will never convince a monkey to give you his banana by promising him that he will get a thousand bananas in the monkey's paradise and he right. said it doesn't work with monkeys but it works with men and this in a way this vulnerability is what makes our strength our ability to be moved by narrative, by common narrative, sometimes common fiction that will create, um, yeah, alliances and an ability to yeah, create. And I think this is what we need today. This is what we need politically. This is probably also what we need to be able to uh, be agents of change. In, for example, in the climate change we are um, experimenting now, and I think particularly this summer, I think so many of us are aware that this is a turning point in, uh, uh, in history. And, uh, and this is an absolute, absolute shofar calling. Now we, I mean, it's, we, are, we are beyond the Kia and Shvarim. We are really in the terroir sound of the climate change. And there's, I mean, there, I, I don't know what is left behind, what kind of cold can come, but it has to be, uh, a, a narrative that brings us to to action. Mm. Um, but if we say look, common narratives, I'd also say, of course, that's sort of, it's always a difficult, um, it's a very difficult topic because um, common narratives are also the same thing that create, um, can have the potential to create negative uh, mm -hmm. unity, you know, and further destructive forces. Uh, and so on, but I would like. Yeah, to I think, I think it's, yeah, it's an important point. Oh, sorry, what you're yeah, saying yeah. now. Yeah, I think it's very important what you're saying now because we know that narratives can be a bracha or a klala. It can be a blessing or it yeah. can be a malediction. And I think it's particularly relevant for future religious leaders to meditate on this idea and to consider this idea. I mean, we know that with stories, you can give birth and you can and you can kill, you can bring the best and the worst. And I think that's why, you know, our, our job, our, I mean, like the, our responsibility as religious leaders is to always wonder uh, what our narratives and interpretations give birth to. I mean, this is this is our responsibility, and this is our, I, I believe this is our sacred work, really, to, to always consider what our, 
our interpretations can create or destroy in the world. And if we think about the environment, for example, it's a pretty interesting example that, uh, you know, in, in, the, in Genesis, when uh, Adam is placed into the world in the Garden of Eden, there are two versions of what Adam is supposed to do. In the first version, it says that the creation and the animals are there and Adam is supposed to control, to have an absolute control over nature and creation. And then there is another verse that claims that Adam is supposed to take care of the earth, to work and to keep the planet, to keep the earth. So it's like, you know, it's another verse that opens a totally different word of possible interpretation. Because it, the, if you choose, you know, the first verse or the second, you actually create another civilization. And I believe that the, the you know, the, the, the brokenness between like the, the split between these two verses is precisely where we stand now. Um, I would, um, as time is, uh, is uh, running away from us as ever, I, but I would feel amiss if I didn't, um, if I didn't at least uh, uh, get your book into, into there for a second. Um, um, is, I, okay, let me do this. Right, so your, um, uh, your book, Antisemitism um, Revisited, or the, the German, German title is Überlegungen zur Frage des Antisemitismus, um, uh, came out before the pandemic uh, came out in 2019, I believe, and was a, um, uh, a, a bestseller here in, in Germany as well as in France and in a lot of other countries and in different languages. And if I can just sort of break down the argument, um, it's also about this, um, about this relationship between, um, or one of the arguments, I'm sorry, about unity and, and division insofar as it, um, or identity and non-identity, and also refers to other uh, social uh, social phenomena like racism and xenophobia. So while xenophobia is the contempt of the other, um, antisemitism is uh, the contempt or hatred of the one who is sort of like the other, but not quite, right? So who is part of society at large, but, at, uh, but also a community apart. And that Jews in such are sort of a permanent reminder that this, um, homogeny and especially uh, unity is impossible, um, which is a, a really interesting, uh, really interesting approach. And, a, and of course, um, an extremely um, and, a, and an extremely uh, um, learned at the same time, of course, very entertaining um, read. Um, uh, and it, because it brings you into the depths of um, of the Talmud and rabbinical literature, if you're even if you're expecting something completely uh, completely different, and now your new book, as we uh, talked about briefly, um, is going to be on um, on death and mourning, um, mm. and of course, in these, uh, especially in the past uh, one and a half years, uh, we've all had to deal with um, death and the potential of mourning. Um, especially uh, through the, the COVID pandemic. I believe there are only very few um, who haven't been touched by the pandemic in either direct loss of family members or of friends or people we know or have, um, have at least tangential um, relationships with uh, throughout this year. And also with um, terrible, uh, terrible um, circumstances in which um, uh, in which mourning in uh, traditional sense is also hindered through things like uh, COVID regulations, but not only mournings, but burials themselves take place in completely strange settings. And of course, you as, um, as a rabbi could um, speak a, a lot more about this and about the ways of also dealing with these, um, with a new um, definition of mourning, not as a community, um, uh, experience or as a family experience, but also as an experience of isolation and being apart from uh, the ones one would actually uh, mourn with. But um, I would just like to ask because this, um, the, uh, the death and mourning topic um, um, uh, seem to be topics that aren't really, um, that at least from just hearing them, can't be uh, topics that we can rally around to create something. Right, mm -hmm. um, or to change something. Um, 
But I'm sure that uh, this is only because I associate it wrongly. And that's why I'm already looking forward to the book to see what you make out of these terms. But maybe you can give us some kind of uh, sneak yeah. peek before the book appears in Germany. It's already appeared in French. I would, I would love to. It's um, the book. Um, I, I mean, for years, I've, I wanted to write this book about death and mourning and my experience as a rabbi accompanying uh, mourners in this um, in this path um, because I, I, you know as you can imagine and as many of you are already doing or will do I spend a lot of times in cemetery and mourners houses and very often I realize that people um, um, can't even imagine what you know what our work is about and how we we can find through the tradition sometimes the gestures and the, the words that can change everything in the way we're able facing death to not let the death win. You know, Judaism is a very special endeavor and, and a special power, I think, in, in making sure that the lechaim and the way we celebrate life still has a place in the cemetery, which, by the way, is called Bet Chaim, the house of life, the house of the livings. And in Mourner's house, we have a specific way of making sure that living forces are winning against death. And what was striking in the year and a half or two years we just experienced is that many, many families perceived that words and rituals and gestures were suddenly impossible um, they were, you know, prevented by the COVID regulation or impeached. Uh, you know, I witnessed, as many of you, probably many funerals where no one could come, no one could go home with the mourners who were left by themselves, alone, without, you know, a hand to hold or someone to be by their side. And suddenly, I think it explains, for me at least, a little bit with the success of the book, because the book is... Uh, uh, for the past four months has been uh, in like the top, uh, like the first book, uh, the first bestseller in France for the past four months. And it says something, I think, about the lack of uh, discourse and ability to talk about death and mourning processes in our society. I'm struck to see that almost every week I get between like 10 and 20 letters from people who read the book. Most of them are not Jewish and uh, don't even have any religious tradition, but they they look in the book and they somehow find in the book uh, uh, a way to you know to place or to talk about their own ghosts and mourning processes that no one uh, uh, talk about. So I think, as you said, we do experience in our society a true dark spot, like a true. Uh, you know, we, we are missing something in our ability to speak about death and therefore to speak about life. Mm. Uh, sounds, uh, sounds like an enticing read and we'll, uh, we're looking forward to uh, reading it in translation if, we're not, if we don't have a strong, uh, a strong set of French. But Delphine, let me thank you for now. Um, uh, for the conversation. I look forward to, um, to continuing the conversation. And of course, even though we only, um, only sort of scraped by your book that is actually available in Germany at the moment, um, I still um, want to uh, recommend it to everyone who's not read it yet. Überlegungen zur Frage des Antisemitismus, Antisemitism Revisited, which um, uh, appears here with um, Hansa, uh, in Munich. And I think I'll pass the baton over to Max again. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Yo, for your moderation as always. And Delphine, I mean, I have, you don't know how many notes I have written here already about everything, but um, so we, uh, we want to hear from our students. We want to have a talk with them. But before that happens, I have to say to everyone on YouTube, thank you very much for watching. Um, the live stream will be ending, but I'll give a, an, a hint that on October 28th, at the same time, uh, our series continues with Rabbi Leonid Bimbat um, about resiliency and his presentation will be called Not by Fiddler of, on the Roof Alone, Survival Strategies of Russian Jews. So we look forward to uh, that. <laughs> but we thank you very much. Uh, I think everyone on YouTube, uh, you know, uh, was very pleased too. And uh, with that, we'll be ending 
the live stream. Okay, the live stream is over.